Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again. I can't be too far off the mark when I say that for the majority of us, I feel like our Bond fandom can be traced all the way back to childhood. I know so many Bond fans with similar stories about sitting down with parents or relatives and enjoying 007 adventures as a family experience, and indeed for the longest time, family audiences were a key target demographic of the James Bond brand. And I know this may seem kind of insane, considering he's a guy whose main interests include killing people and having sex with as many pretty ladies under the age of 35 as possible, but sure enough, for decades, the Bond marketing machine produced a waft of media and products specifically aimed at keeping adolescent aspiring agents happy. However, this tact kind of changed during the more recent Daniel Craig era. Hey, you. Yes, you, potential child consumer. You like James Bond, right? Well, do you like action figures? Do you like lunchboxes? Do you like backpacks, toy cars, video games? Well, in that case, here's a backgammon set. That'll be five grand, thanks. Calvin! What have you been doing with my credit card? And maybe this shift in the focus of the marketing is understandable, given where the Craig era has positioned itself tonally. I mean, when I was growing up in the 90s, Brosnan's Bond was very much a cool, fun, suave action hero with the, you know, the fancy cars and the kick-ass cool gadgets, and there was just a big, fun, pulpy vibe to the whole thing, whereas Craig's era has a lot of that same stuff too, but it feels like there's a lot less in his film for the younger end of the audience, and as such, the whole marketing and product shift is understandable. And hey, maybe Fleming himself would have even been glad of this. And I meant for uh, warm-blooded heterosexual adults, you know, in beds and railway trains and aeroplanes. They're not meant for schoolboys. But the modern skittishness about brazenly marketing a womanizing license to kill Bond to kids is particularly hilarious when you look back through the series history and come across things like 1965's A Child's Guide to Blowing Up a Motor Car, a promotional piece for Thunderball featuring a psychotic young boy and his uncle visiting the film set of that film and picking up some questionable skills as a result of the trip. And just before we get into talking about the short in detail, this is my final holiday season shout out to Exter, the smart wallet brand are currently having a Christmas sale on their website with up to 35% off across the store and even including free gift bags as well. There's a link to the website below, so head over there for more details. They pack in so many nifty features into these things, and they still manage to be sleeker and smarter than any regular wallet I've ever had. So if you're in the market for an upgrade yourself or as a gift for someone else for Christmas, then do check the site out. I honestly never tire of using that card release button, it is so satisfying. And for those of you wondering if I ever did manage to get a laser installed in this little thing, well, no, of course I didn't. The thing opens with a clip from Thunderball, where we see James Bond in his Aston Martin being pursued when Fiona Volpe appears on her motorbike and uses some explosives to dispatch of the pursuing vehicle. The rest of the program sets out to show us how this particular sequence was filmed, courtesy of the Ford Motor Company and Dennis Norden, as the quite elaborate opening titles inform us. This is actually a really fun and inventive way of getting all the credits in there, though, through gadgets and official-looking documents and such. And to say that this is just a barely 15-minute featurette, I'm surprised that it would have such a well thought through and creative title sequence, in all honesty. Then the story proper begins, and things seem quaint enough. When your mother rang and told me it was your birthday today, I thought, well, what can I give old Chris? As your godfather, it's up to me to give you something pretty special, isn't it, eh? And then I had this brainwave. I'll take you to watch a scene from the new James Bond picture actually being filmed. Well, that's a pretty incredible gift. Can I be your godson as well, please? I'd certainly be more appreciative than this sour-faced brat. Look on the look on his face! I mean, you'd think his godfather was taking him to have his toenails pulled out by rusty pliers. Oh my god, this is so lame. Why does nobody in the family understand me? But things take a turn quite quickly as the little pervert begins sifting through his godfather's softcore porn material. Are those, uh, those photos are from this Thunderbolt film? They're what they call stills. See, in the film, those nice ladies, they're James Bond's chums. I keep them in the car because it saves using the heater. Oh my god, Uncle, why are these seats so sticky? <clears throat> it looks like we're almost there then, lad. The pair arrive at the set, and we actually get some really cool behind-the-scenes shots here of the film crew going about their business, and, and we even see people who you don't normally get to see much of in these behind-the-scenes kinds of things. Like, you know, we see the carpenters, and the continuity person, and even the stills photographer, who seems uh, more than just a bit annoyed by this lady casually brushing by. What the? You, you starting on me, love? You starting? Come on, then. But the big names, of course, get mentioned too, including director Terence Young, stuntman, and Bob Simmons and the producers. Now, here's a couple of gentlemen you should take a photograph of, Chris. It's Mr. Harry Saltzman and Mr. Cubby Broccoli, the producers. They're very important men, Chris. You'd be extremely polite and you mean, don't, don't, they could be very useful to Uncle Dennis. Useful? What are you going to do to them? 
The whole shtick here, of course, is that the adult is quite giddy and excited about being on the film set, whereas the boy is just kind of bored by the whole thing. As an adult myself... No, really, I am. I do actually find some of this stuff with the uncle very relatable, including his geek out moment when he spots Sean Connery's chair. Hey, 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 Chris, look, look, Sean Connery! That's Sean Connery's own chair! Look, they're just carrying him! Oh. Well, it's a fantastic likeness, it's a shame we just don't know who of. But even the prospect of meeting Bond himself doesn't seem to do much for the young ne'er do well, who instead resorts to pranking the producers. Are you out of your mind? Are you insane? Do you want me to wake up tomorrow with a horse's head in my bed? And then he follows that up with apparent suicide attempts. Chris! 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 Just though his job isn't dangerous enough already. Now, just watch, just watch! No wonder his godfather's a bunch of nerves. This kid's like a lemming trying to throw himself off a cliff. It's around this point that things to become really quite rambling. I know that there was a credit at the start of this thing for writing, but honestly, at this point it feels like the narrator's just ad-libbing over whatever he sees on screen. He's not fishing, it's it's part of the conference. That's uh, walkie-talkie, they're all discussing points. Continuities, making notes. Everybody checks their walkie-talkies. They all use walkie-talkies on an outdoor location these days. I do kind of like how the short doesn't gloss over the fact that a lot of filming is actually, you know, setting up and waiting around and it can take whole days to produce something that lasts for just a few seconds on screen. But finally filming gets underway for the sequence where the car explodes and it's really cool to see. I mean, it would have been even cooler if we actually saw the car explode, but coincidentally that's just when the filming truck obscures it from view. <laughs> Well, gee, thanks, filming truck. Want to get in the way of any other Bond explosions while you're at it as well? This is the part I really like. Anyway, the dreary urchin still doesn't look to be very interested. The only thing that seems to get a rise out of him seems to be the ability to light his godfather's cigarette before insidiously indicating that smoking in this vicinity is not permissible. A lovely, wholesome image there, though, don't you agree? I mean, maybe the kid will be so good as to actually roll the cigarette next time. Anyway, over to stuntman Bob Simmons, who we see supervising the rigging of the car with explosives for the next take as the... Jesus, Bob, keep your trousers on, there are children present. During the explanation of how the explosive effects are created, it becomes clear that our soundless scamp is actually the seed of Satan, as his eyes light up and the cogs in his head start turning as to how this newfound information can possibly be used to his advantage. I mean, seriously, I'm getting proper Children of the Damned Omen vibes from this hellspawn. Then, the moment the driver turns that switch, a spark flashes between the wires and, what? up it all goes. <laughs> We get another take of the stunt, and can I actually just call out the balls on this camera guy? Like, the stuntman has jumped from the vehicle at this point, and the flaming car is careening towards him, and he's just all like, Oh, well, I guess I'll just pivot the camera then. The same kind of laughing in the face of danger cannot be extended to the sound designers, who frequently irk the narrator into making a sarcastic jibe. And once again, the intrepid sound engineers risk all for their art. It's quite unfair, really. I mean, I don't think that the sound engineers need to necessarily strap themselves to the chassis of the vehicle in order to do their jobs appropriately, or maybe they just saw that you brought this child of the damned with you, and that's really what they're hiding from. The next few clips play in relative silence from the narrator as he runs out of things to say, I guess, and only chimes back in to pass comment on director Terence Young stopping for lunch, God forbid. More food? What it all costs. Oh, he, he has to think about it. Didn't look like he's starving on it, though, does he? And he's wearing clothes, too. Look at him, the gall on that man, keeping warm, I suppose. Honestly, at this point, it just feels like they're padding for time until they show us the final take of the day, which ends up being over in a flash. And then we cut to the next week, where the bloke seems to have wrangled their way into a screening of the edit of the sequence. I mean, seriously, who is this guy related to to get all these perks? And how are the boys' school not concerned over the amount of time he's spending away from the classroom? Actually, you know what? The teachers and pupils of that school are probably pleased to spend an afternoon without that dreadful boy around. I mean, when he's there, he probably just sits silently at the back of every class, pranking his peers with toads in their desks and setting the adult's hair alight with his mind powers. You're a pleasure to take out. He really, he really is. He's a pleasure to take out. Get those filthy human paws off me, you meat sack! Come along, dear. I've got you live mice for dinner, just like you asked. Bye, Chris.
The short ends making good on its title, as the prophecy is fulfilled and the child, indeed, blows up the motor car. Quite how Damien here has the gall to look sad in this moment is something to behold, but maybe it's all part of his scheme to get out of any kind of juvenile incarceration. Not that bars would keep him contained, mind, I'm sure he can probably shapeshift his way out of any kind of human cell. But never fear, our protagonist survives this experience somehow, as did his 8x10 glossy still of Martin Beswick, but alas, with both hands in casts, it's clear that our hero can't enjoy the image for its intended purpose. So that's the end of that. Uh, thanks, Ford? This is so such an oddity. Obviously, Ford provided vehicles for use during the filming of Thunderball, and this is very much a tongue-in-cheek promotional short designed to promote the film and the association with Ford. But looking at this today, it is just so weird. Obviously, this thing was designed and intended for a different era. No, really, it was. And a different media landscape. But as with all of these archival featurettes that I look at on this channel, I, th there's only so much that you can get out of these things while appreciating that it was made for a different context. But is this worth a Bond fan's time to to dig out today. I mean, it's on YouTube, it's on the Thunderbolt Blu-ray. Is anyone's appreciation or knowledge of the 007 universe going to be further enlightened through viewing this? Well, I would say no, or at least I don't think that it's up there with Welcome to Japan, Mr. Bond, or the 20th Anniversary Special, or even The Incredible World of James Bond, which features much better behind-the-scenes footage of the same sequence from this short. Obviously, the behind-the-scenes shots are nice, but they end up reusing bits of footage, and the whole presentation does drag on somewhat, and overall it just feels like it could have been about half as long, and the Dennis Norden voiceover has its own charm, and there are a couple of funny moments, but I'd honestly just rather be listening to whatever these people on set were actually saying, though I appreciate that that would not have perhaps been as interesting to the intended audience for this back in 1965. Overall, I'd say it's one of the weaker Bond archival featurettes that's featured on the home media disc, so I'd recommend giving it a... giving it a... Sorry, giving it... giving it a... Of course, what I meant to say is that I love it. I think it's great, and it stars the most darling, precocious, talented young man who is surely bound for some kind of great Hollywood success after this feature. <clears throat> oh, God. Oof. So, if you want to see it, I would highly recommend checking out the Thunderball Blu-ray disc, or indeed the two-disc Ultimate Edition DVD, and in the meantime, if you are a fan of this channel, you can head below to find links to my various social media pages, including my Facebook page, my Twitter page, and for those of you who want to go one extra step in supporting this channel, you can head over to my Patreon page, and the links to all of those things are below. Also, leave me a comment below if you have also loved this particular featurette, and let me know, let everyone know how much you love it. Until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.